Hi everyone, you are again with Lipta with Rajeshwari Kalyanam at the JLF, the vibrant place. Please excuse the noise if there's anything. We are here with Mr. Frank Decotter. Uh, he, he has been writing amazing books on China. He's from. He's a. Uh, he's a very popular writer from Hong Kong, right, sir? Yes, I do live and work in Hong Kong. Work in Hong Kong, Indeed. which is which is in fact China. But mm. <laughs> so, could you tell us about uh, your latest book, and then we will go back to your previous uh, works and about your uh, writings on China and the governance there? And Sounds so good. On. How much time do we have? We have fifteen minutes, <laughs> and you can go on. I can have a second edition, but of yes. course, how to be a dictator? That's the title of my last book. And um, you might think that it's going to be a ladybird book. Some of the readers complain about the fact that there are no strict 12 rules to follow in order to become a dictator. But of course, the reason for that is very simple. It's not so easy. It's not like taking swimming lessons. It takes great ability and a great deal of luck to do so. So what the book shows really is how in eight case studies, eight of these individuals were quite unique and in quite unique historical circumstances managed to concentrate all power in their own hands. So these eight cases are, of course, the predictable dictators. Hitler must be in there. Stalin, uh, Stalin is in there. The first one, I think, was Mussolini. Your he inspired Mao. both of them. Mao! Absolute must. <laughs> How can we live without the chairman in a book on dictators? And then, of course, a few minor ones. Kim Il-sung is not exactly minor, but it's a smaller country. And three dictators people may not have heard about all that much. One is Papa Doc Duvalier, François Duvalier, uh, who was dictator in uh, Haiti, half of an island really, and a very impoverished one at that too. Then there is Ceausescu, hard to pronounce, but probably uh, one of the few dictators who truly believed in the cult of personality, he truly thought he was a genius taken aback when the crowd started shouting at him in Romania Bucharest December 89 ended up a week later being shot against the toilet block with his wife and the last one is Mengistu very few people have heard of him but he was a great mass murderer in Africa and of course ran Ethiopia with an iron hand probably responsible for 1.5 to 2 million uh, deaths people sent to an early grave. There is a subtitle and the subtitle is The Cult of personality. So I look not just at how to be a dictator, but I say in the book that beyond the use of sheer violence, uh, the cult of personality is actually very important too. So that's the new sort of angle. Is that the reason you're um, kind of, you? Um, how did you get to know these or select these dictators? Obviously, you had read about a lot about dictators. What led you to that and uh, why this fascination or rather interest in the whole way the dictators' minds work, which yes. has been mostly the premise of your current book? Yes. So the, the, the book I finished before this one was on the Cultural Revolution. And we know what happens from 1966 to 1976. Uh, Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong and the People's Republic of China uh, uses ordinary people to ferret out hounds, people who he believes might be counter-revolutionaries in the ranks of the party, the army and the government. Most of all, the term cultural revolution has culture in it. He wanted to destroy what he thought was bourgeois, capitalist, feudal, superstitious culture and replace it with true proletarian culture, socialist values, which, of course, in the end turn out to be nothing but the cult of personality. In other words, you have to buy a Mao bust, a Mao portrait. You must read his poems, his musings, his mottos appear everywhere. It is as if there is no one else beyond Chairman Mao. You must be able to recite his work uh, upside down virtually. So that got me thinking about the cult of personality. Was that just something to do with the Cultural Revolution? And I came to the conclusion that ultimately a cult of personality is an attempt by dictators to create the illusion uh, that everyone in the country truly loves them. And it comes back to what I call the paradox of the dictator. A dictator, by definition, seizes power. He didn't get elected at the ballot box. Um, but we live in an age of democracy. The 20th century is an age of democracy. So the dictator must create the illusion of popular support. And he does so 
by forcing ordinary people to acclaim him in parades, to read his work, acclaim his genius, bow to his portrait, you know, recite his name, etc., etc. But I also discovered that there's another aspect to the cult of personality which matters a great deal. If you are a dictator, you seize power, then of course it raises the possibility that somebody else might do the same thing to you. Absolutely. Somebody might stab you in the back. So the real concern for a dictator is not actually ordinary people. It's number two, number three, four, five, all those around you, your own entourage, sometimes your comrades in arms, uh, sometimes just loyal followers. But how do you know that they are really f- loyal? So, so they live in a perennial fear of They become paranoid about a coup being organized against them. Now, the cult of personality helps because when you force all those around you to acclaim you in public, in front of all the others, you turn your closest allies into liars. And when everybody lies, it becomes very difficult to find out who truly believes what. It becomes very difficult to organize a coup. You acclaim the leader, I acclaim the leader. How would I know what you think? How do I know what I think? Ultimately, So this is why I think that the cult of personality uh, is ultimately a much more effective weapon to truly capture the minds of the population than ruling through sheer violence alone. Historians have, of course, written at great length about the violence, the secret police, the camps, the gulag, the knock on the middle of the door. But we know a lot less about the fear instilled through the cult of personality. So what I'm trying to say is that this cult of personality is not there to convince people. You know, Adolf Hitler doesn't have a cult that wishes to convince ordinary Germans that he truly is a messiah sent by God to save the German nation. No, the purpose is to crush people's dignity to sow confusion, to somehow uh, enforce obedience and isolate individuals from each other, where people no longer talk to each other about the leader, except in terms of which are, uh, you know, adulatory, where you claim who the leader is. So ultimately, fear is enforced not just through the barrel of a gun. Fear is enforced through the cult of personality, where you and I no longer dare to say a bad word about the man in charge. So you've, you've written a lot about China, and uh, you, uh, we will get, get to the topic of China a little later, because I would really mm. like to ask you a few, couple of questions. Of course. Uh, but I would also like to extend this whole idea of dictator. What happens that in a democratic country, mm. suddenly a dictator takes over? What is the situation that's created? What kind of situation lends itself to uh, being that the country is goes into the hands of a dictator? Mm. Well, dictatorship ultimately is concentration of power. The opposite is separation of powers. Separation of powers means that you have an independent judicial system. Um, you have rule of law. Uh, you have checks and balances. You have an opposition party. Um, that's uh, what we talk about when we use the term democracy. A dictator not only wishes to monopolize power, uh, but thinks that it's absolutely necessary to do so and somehow mocks this old bourgeois, wishy-washy liberal idea of separation of powers. Um, that, that is what a dictator does. In what conditions? Well, there again, of course, you have these social scientists who've come up with all their theories about democracy and what? the origins of dictatorship. But I tend to distrust it, rather. Um, clearly, it can happen in any place around the world from a quite developed country like Germany in the 1920s and 30s to a miserable, impoverished place like Haiti on the other side of the world in the 1950s. Um, what I'm trying to say is that there, is, there are prospects for democracy everywhere, and ultimately there must be some fear among all of us um, of vigilance uh, against dictatorship everywhere as well. Now, it's true that in many cases, uh, in particular from our point of view in the 21st century some of these dictatorships have some of these sorry some of these democracies, democracies have had a, a quite a long history there's been time to consolidate them so 
if you take, for instance, the interesting case of Russia, where Putin is often described as a dictator, is he truly a dictator? What would Stalin think if he were to come back to life? He would laugh at Putin. He would say, why do you have an independent judicial system? Why do you have opposition candidates who've been elected onto the Duma in Moscow, the capital of your country? Why don't you just crush all of this? Well, we forget that Russia is constitutionally a federated republic. What I'm trying to say is that Putin cannot hound his political opponents if there is no opposition party. He cannot undermine independent judicial systems if there is no independent judicial system in the first place. So we must make a difference between de-democratization, where there is a democracy with separation of powers, however frail it may be, but there is then de-democratization. We must see that in a different light when compared to dictatorship. In other words, North Korea, dictatorship. People's Republic of China, no separation of powers, dictatorship. Turkey, Erdogan, not a dictatorship. Just a nasty man who's leading his country down the road towards de-democratization. Same for Putin. I think that's the key word in this present generation where you have everywhere leaders trying to de-democratize their Absolutely. Countries. So when people tell me, oh, Trump is a dictator, or the leader of this country or that country is a dictator, it makes me cringe. If you want to say that there is a danger that Erdogan or Putin or even Trump are de-democratizing their countries, I would say yes, that's, that's a good, that's something one should be vigilant about. Eternal vigilance is the price but of is democracy. The, is, is dictatorship working for China? It's going, uh, it's, it's aiming for being a superpower and it's... I think we are, every country is afraid of China now. Yeah, well, we've been here before. You remember the Soviet Union, greatest power on planet Earth? Yes. You remember those businessmen from the United States who would come back from Siberia in the 1970s and 80s and tell us, oh, my God, these Soviets have an economic model that nobody can possibly compete with. Why not just abandon, you know, give up the Cold War? They want it. And when this whole thing came tumbling down, we discovered that, in fact, behind that carefully constructed facade, there was great weakness. And this is surely true for the People's Republic of China as well. There is a great facade, new airports, new highways, an image of strength behind which there is great weakness. Just imagine for a moment that the uh, leader of your country, or Donald Trump, would have at, its, at his disposal the savings of every single citizen. Just imagine that all the banks in the United States would be state banks and Trump can use all that money to build highways and airports and develop a weapon program. It's frightening. That's very it's... frightening. I'm sure he would waste a great deal of it. Well, that's exactly what we have in the People's Republic of China. But unfortunately, I don't think your books are read there, as in or allowed to be. No, read of there. course not. It's a dictatorship. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Although I'm sure people do smuggle it across the border and photocopy it and circulate it in in other ways. Um, but yes, um, it's interesting that my books have been banned. But of course, what is not banned in the People's Republic of China? You cross the border. I see you have a phone here. Why don't you cross the border and try to Google something? No Google. Try to read BBC News. No BBC News. Try to read the South China Morning Post, which is published in Hong Kong. No South China Morning Post. When there is news on TV, on CNN, which is allowed, it will black out whenever it's not convenient. So people, for people who think dictatorship is equal to de uh, development, I think they should see China. Yes, absolutely. There is Especially an issue, exactly. There is there's an issue of personal freedom, uh, religious freedom. Must we talk about Xinjiang? Probably not. I'm sure your listeners will know everything about it. But not just that. What exactly is development? What exactly is growth? What exactly is freedom? What is the price that people in China pay for all of this? This enormous gargantuan waste, empty airports, empty skyscrapers everywhere. China has now enough skyscrapers to house twice the population over, and it's on the decline. Oh, wow. So a lot of this will stand so, empty for decades to come. And uh, thank you so much, sir. In those You're 15 welcome. minutes, you've given us amazing, amazing insights. Thank you so much. Thank you.